Amen. All right, we come back to our text tonight from Daniel chapter 9, Daniel 9 verses 20 to 27, and we've now started the formal discussion of the 70-week prophecies, one of the most encompassing and fascinating prophecies in Scripture. This is because not only does it tell us about the entirety of the prophetic future, that is not only dealing with man in his temporal state that is inside of time, but all the way through the millennium until the beginning of the eternal kingdom. And that's fascinating to recognize that because not only does it tell us about that, but like nowhere else in scripture, it gives us a timetable. It helps us understand chronologically when these events are going to occur. And that's fabulous for us to recognize and so encouraging, so strengthening, something that should indeed motivate our faith so greatly. Last week, we identified a vital link to the 70-year punishment prophecy that came from Jeremiah, that 70 weeks or excuse me, that 70 years of prophecy and how that 70 years of punishment that Jeremiah prophesied was directly linked to the 70-week prophecy of Daniel. Jeremiah's 70 years were punishment for not obeying the Sabbath years of rest for the land, just as Leviticus chapter 26 and verses 34 to 35 described. Let me again read Leviticus 26 and verses 34 and 35 for you. Leviticus 26 and 34. <clears throat> then the land will enjoy its Sabbaths all the days of the desolation while you are in your enemy's land. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation, it will observe the rest which it did not observe on your Sabbaths while you were living on it. What we understand from this is that the Israelites did not observe the Sabbath rest of the land. Now, recognize that Sabbath is a, a broad term in the Hebrew language. Probably most broadly, it means the last day of the week. It is the Sabbath. It is the day of rest. It is the day that God told the Israelites, six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. And included that in his law repeatedly and of course in the Ten Commandments. So, Israel has not observed the land rest. And what that was is that every seven years, Israel was to allow their land to rest. They were not to harvest it. And you might think, well, how are they going to eat? This is an agrarian society. It's all they have to live on. What are they going to do? Well, God told them what they would do. He said that in the sixth year, you would harvest enough for that year and for the next year and until the harvest of the third year, that he would provide ample. And we think, oh, well, gosh, would he do that? Well, let's see. Will God hold to his promises? Maybe we ought to bounce back to the wilderness for just a minute. 40 years in the wilderness. And remember what was to happen on Friday at, e at the evening. They were to collect enough food for two days. Actually, this was Thursday in the evening. They'd collect enough food for Friday and enough food for the Sabbath day rest, Saturday, Shabbat. Did God ever fail them? No. Will God ever fail us? No. So we can rest in that and understand that his promises were yea and amen. But Israel did not trust God in their wickedness of their heart. They failed to believe what God said. And we think, oh, those wicked people. And then we look into, as we learned in men's Bible study and women's Bible study today and tomorrow, that we too look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and we become hearers only and not doers. 
And this is exactly what Israel had done. So the 70 years that Jeremiah had prophesied and that Leviticus 26 prophesied were because they had violated the seven-year Sabbath rest 70 times. Now for the math majors, how much is 7 times 70, Matthew? Thank you, 490, that's right. So technically, God could have punished them for 490 years. But he punished them just for those years of the Sabbath, just for those 70 years. And did they acknowledge and respond to his punishment? So so important that we see this, that we recognize that he was punishing them for 70 years for the 70 times, the 70 periods of seven years that they had not kept the land's Sabbath rest. So it was that 490 years that they did not give the land its cycles of rest. Now this would be all the way back to King Saul and very near the death of Samuel, the last judge. So rather than punishing Israel again for that full time, he narrowed it down to 70 years. But Israel did not repent of her wickedness during this exile. And we see that in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and in most of the minor prophets, Israel's wickedness continued. They continued to reject the word of the prophets and the word of God. So in keeping with Leviticus 26, 18, which we read last week, God would continue to punish them, only now he would do so seven times more. 490 years. We described last week how the 70 weeks prophecy was the word weeks is the word sabuim, and it is a parallel for our word decade, although instead of 10 years, it's seven years. So that 70 weeks or 70 years of seven was 490 years. Do you see the direct connectivity to the abandonment of the Sabbath rest and to the reduced punishment that God allowed them to go through, but they continued to rebel against him, and therein he carried out the punishment of the full 490 years. And this is criti a critical connection from Jeremiah's 70-year prophecy of judgment directly to the 490-year violation of Israel's seven-year Sabbath rest, but also to her coming 490-year judgment or 70 weeks that she would face again as judgment for her wickedness. Now, additionally, in verse 24 of Daniel 9, it showed us six facets of these 70 weeks, all of them directly relating to Messiah. The first three of these six confirming the aspects of judgment. Lest we wonder if these 70 weeks that were spoken about at the beginning of verse 24 were judgmental or just prophetic fulfillment, recognize from the verse itself that it is very clearly judgment. The first three aspects reflecting that judgment and also connecting to Messiah's first advent, specifically to Christ's crucifixion. These three receiving final completion at his second advent, but being indicated at his first. Look at them again quickly with me. It was 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, judgment, to make an end of sin, judgment, to make atonement for iniquity. So this was a judgment that would begin with Christ at the cross, but would not find ultimate fulfillment until his second coming. The second group of three, specifically relating to Jesus' second coming and his formal, literal, thousand-year reign on David's throne. Again, as described in Revelation 19 and 20, 
and also Ezekiel 40 to 48. And those second three in verse 24 relating to his second coming are to bring in everlasting righteousness. This is not imputed righteousness that we have from Christ. This is ultimate and actual righteousness in mankind. That will not happen until after Christ returns to judge the wicked of the earth. It won't ultimately happen until the end of the millennial kingdom when he finally takes through and becomes the ultimate judge at the great white throne judgment. Following that, in verse 24, was to seal up vision and prophecy. Vision and prophecy occurred in the largest uh, the, the largest uh, venue ever during that period of the church, during Acts and the beginning of the church. And that prophetic, those sign gifts, those miracles, those tongues, those healings were for one purpose only, and it was to authenticate the men who had the gift as those sent by God with his message such that when they penned the scripture, everyone recognized, oh, these are the men that had the gifts. These are the men whom God has sent and gifted. However, from Joel chapter 2, which is proclaimed in Acts 15, we recognize that prophecy and vision will again return. Let's make sure we're accurate to all of Scripture. Let's not become so dogmatic that we want to ignore part of the stuff that's not as easy for us. But this is not a problem because that prophecy and that vision that will occur will be during the final year, the final week or seven years of Daniel's vision. And then it too will conclude, as Joel tells us, and as we see in Daniel 24 to seal up vision and prophecy, and thirdly, to anoint the most holy place. And as we've spoken about last time, that is to anoint the temple, which the second temple that Ezra and Nehemiah built, that Herod modified, was never anointed. It never had the presence of God dwelling in it. God's presence left the temple in Ezekiel 8 through 12, and it never returned. The re-anointing where God's presence will again be in the temple will not occur during the third temple, which is the one that Antichrist will desecrate in Revelation, but it will occur in the fourth temple in the millennial temple. And that anointing will not just be the spiritual presence of God with the Ark of the Covenant, it will be God himself in Jesus Christ reigning on the throne of David. So these are the promises that will be fulfilled at the second coming in verse 24. Now I passed out a chart last week relating to the chronology and you may want to keep it handy for you if you have it. We'll be referring to it tonight. If you're at home and didn't get one, email me and we'll be happy to get you a copy of that. But it, uh, there are some details we'll talk about this evening. So, all right, let, let's read our text and let's get back into an arousing announcement and three facets of prophecy to motivate your faith. And specifically where we are, our third point in this message, although we've been on it for a few weeks now, and that is what will again occur. So look with me if you would. We're going to read beginning in verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince... There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with the flood. Even to the end, there will be war, 
desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So verse 25 begins as we come back to this third point. So you are to know and discern all of these details. And that third point, what will again occur? And verse 25 begins, so you are to know and discern. This is a reminder for us of the fact that Daniel did not know and discern the prophecies of chapter 7 and 8, but that he was told by the, by the angel Gabriel that he would discern these back in verse 22. Again, he didn't previously understand, but now he would. And the first thing he is to know is where this whole vision is to begin. And this is super important for us. If we're to understand chronology, we want to know what the starting point is. And this is exactly what Gabriel wants him to recognize. The first thing he is to know is where this is to begin, and that is the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Don't lose sight of that phrase. That the beginning is the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, when was this? It's vitally important because to get to the rest of the periods of the prophecy and to get the end right, we have to know where to begin. Three possible decrees exist that could be the starting point of this prophecy. The first is Cyrus's decree to rebuild Jerusalem. You would find that on your chart uh, down on uh, the, the third bullet point, first year of Cyrus and the beginning of the second temple, 538 BC. That's proposed. That is a decree that could be the starting point. Now, we recognize that that is also that which was prophesied in Isaiah 44 and 45, and again, which occurred in 538 B.C., as you see there in your timeline. Now, the second possibility is Artaxerxes' decree to Ezra to return into the construction of Jerusalem, that the, the construction would continue and that they would possess the land. This also on your chart, you'll notice from the seventh bullet point was in 458 BC. Again, there on your timeline. This was described for us, this decree in Ezra chapter 7. The third option is Artaxerxes' degree, decree to Nehemiah in 444 B.C. We find this in Nehemiah chapter 2. Well, to answer the question, we must keep the whole verse in mind. We need to look at the context as we assess these three options. Tanner, so helpful in all of this. First, the restoring and rebuilding of Jerusalem must be kept in mind. Secondly, the two time periods of seven weeks and 62 weeks, that is 49 years and 434 years, must be kept in mind. And the third point from the verse is that the culmination of these two, that is seven and 62 weeks, and that period is to the time of the coming of Messiah the Prince. All right, with these in mind, let's look at our first option of Cyrus' decree, and we find that this will not fulfill all the particulars of the verse. The decree was only to rebuild the temple. Remember, the verse says that the rebuilding is of the city of Jerusalem, not just the temple. This would have also been 489 B.C., so that 
time that 49 years after the city was to be rebuilt, that first seven weeks of 49 years, taken from the time of the decree of 538, would have resulted in a time of 489 B.C. And yet what we recognize from Nehemiah is that clearly the city was not rebuilt in fact, the book of Nehemiah, if you remember our Old Testament survey work, we had Nehemiah, remember? He's kneeling on the walls. The point of, the war of Nehemiah is walls. It is rebuilding the walls. So it was not done at that time. So again, we see that this prophecy could not be it. And lastly, the combination of 69 years plus seven years, or a total of 483 years, from the date of the prophecy would take us to 55 B.C. Nothing happened of note in 55 B.C. that we can connect any of this with. So clearly, the first decree of Cyrus to start the rebuilding of the temple is not the right answer. The second option is also less likely, but it's better. In favor of this, and this second one is the consideration that the decree was Artaxerxes to Ezra in 458 B.C. And in favor of this is that the 69 weeks or the 483 years from 458 B.C. would take us to 25 or 26 A.D. And it could have been around the time of Jesus' baptism and the formal beginning of his ministry. And because of that, some think this could have merit. But the problem with this is that verse 26 says that at the end of 62 weeks that the Messiah is going to be cut off. Well, that leaves a long period between 25 and 26 A.D., to either 30 A.D. or 33 A.D. when the crucifixion had to occur. And we'll touch more on why it had to occur then in a minute. So this also is not as likely as the others. And only two possible years really for the timing of the crucifixion occur. And that is, there are only two years as we've been able to look at, now we can go back with sophisticated technology, check the cycles of the moons and all of these details. There are only two years in which the Passover fell on a Friday. And that is either 30 A.D. or 33 A.D. One of those two years is the year that Jesus had to be crucified. Why? Because it had to be a Friday so that three days later, on the first day of the week, he would be raised from the dead. We see this in three separate scriptures confirming that fact. Mark 16, 2, Luke 24, 1, and John 21. So the second option fails here. And the the second option of the decree to Ezra also fails because in, in Ezra chapter 7, at his return, there is no authority to rebuild the city. When Artaxerxes gives Ezra the decree to go back, he says, go back so that the people can possess the land and live in it and that you can continue the ornamentation of the temple. The temple is done with its base construction, so the stones are up. That happened in 516 B.C., but there's no ornamentation. None of the accoutrements that accompany the temple were done. None of the, the, the finishes, none of the gold, none of the furniture, none of the fixtures, none of the separation of the holy place from the most holy place. So that's what Ezra went back to do, not to rebuild the city. The third option of the decree to Nehemiah in 444 B.C. is then best. First, Artaxerxes' degree to ne decree to Nehemiah is specifically to rebuild the city. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verses 5 through 8 proclaim that for us. 
Second, the book of Nehemiah and Ezra chapter Four, chapter 4 and verses 7 to 23 and there in Ezra 4 he is writing prior to himself going but giving an overview of the entire process and he says as did Nehemiah that clearly that the rebuilding was during a time of great distress and that's just what was occurring and notice the end of verse 25 even in times of distress. So, Nehemiah's affirmation and the decree to him from Artaxerxes also best fits because of that. And that is the only view that harmonizes with the timing of Jesus' crucifixion and the Passover year per the 69 weeks or the 483 years. But we have an issue with our timetable because if we take our 365 day and a quarter calendar year and we go back to the time of the decree in 444 BC and we subtract 483 years we come up to 40 BC keep in mind that when we do this transition and we go from BC to AD there's no zero year so if you do the math, it's going to come up 39. Trust me, go ahead and pull your phones out. And, and, and if you subtract 4, take 483 and subtract, excuse me, take 444 and subtract 483, you're going to get 39. But because there's no zero year, it would be 40. Well, that's a problem because I just said it's got to be either 30 or 33 AD. So what's going on? What do we have to understand from this? Well, several things. Over the centuries, most every society has had their own calendar. Now, the calendar that we use today is, is pretty much uniform around the world. It's called the Gregorian calendar because of Gregory the Great. That calendar was created in 1582 AD, less than 500 years ago. That's really not very long in light of the 6,000 year history of man. The calendar that was most widely used prior to that was called the Julian calendar. And it began in 45 BC. But there were problems with the Julian calendar. In fact, the Julian calendar got the birth of Jesus wrong. Jesus' birth on the Julian calendar showed at z the zero point where B.C. before Christ turned to A.D. and that is not what actually happened. And this is why the Gregorian calendar was brought forward because they were recognizing that there was a chronological time frame with the calendars. So, as we looked more deeply into this, we understood more of these details. And in fact, that B.C., which was, uh, again, before Christ, and A.D., which was uh, supposed to stand for the year of the Lord, Adeno Domini, was wrong. And Jesus' birth, per the Gregorian calendar, is somewhere between 6 B.C., and 4 B.C. And we say, whoa! No, don't panic. This is men making mistakes. I know you've never made many, but I've already acknowledged several of mine today. And probably you have one out there somewhere. Well, so did Julius Caesar, because he's setting everything around himself. We know that Jesus was not born at zero because Herod the great, per several extra-biblical resources, is shown to have died in 4 BC. And yet we know that this is the same Herod who went to kill the children in Bethlehem, which was when Jesus was well over a year old. Thus his birth year 
had to be somewhere between 6 and 5 BC. Some that say it could go to 4 is because they moved the months around. But in reality, that was a mistake and was a problem. So we see that uh, the Jewish calendar then is different as well from these. The Jewish calendar, instead of having 365 and a quarter days, actually had 360 days. It had 12 30-day months. 360 days. And this is confirmed in the book of Genesis on the flood account. In the flood account, twice we're told in Genesis that the water was on the earth for 150 days. We're given that piece of information in Genesis 7, 24 and in Genesis 8, 3. And the time frame is also given to us of the beginning and end of the flood. The flood began on the 17th day of the second month as recorded in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. And the end of that 150-day continuation of the waters upon the earth is the 17th day of the seventh month. 7 minus 2 is 5, times 30 is 150. 150 days of water upon the earth, confirming 30-day months in the Jewish calendar. We further see the 30-day month of the Jewish calendar in the book of Revelation. You say, wait a minute, that's still future. But it wasn't written to us, and it wasn't written this year. It happened before all of these other modifications. But if we went and we looked at the covenant that Antichrist makes, which is also referred to in Daniel, with Israel, that is to be for one week or for seven years, and he violates it halfway through, that violation is recorded in Revelation as being 42 months or 1,260 days. 30 day, 42, 30 day months. So we have confirmation at the beginning and end of the Bible about the Jewish calendar. So as we take this 490 years, and I know this is a lot of math, hang in there with me, but we, it just, it's so great. I hope you're loving it. I'm loving it. If we take the 490 years and we multiply that times a 360 day year, we came up with exactly 173,880 days from the decree of Artaxerxes to Nehemiah until the coming of the prince who is Messiah. Okay, that's all fine and good, but it gets better. Because reckoning this to our calendar means dividing these days, 1, 000, or 173,880 by 365 and a quarter days, and this brings us to just over 476 years. Now, if we do the math and we take the time of the decree in 444 BC and subtract 476, accounting for the zero year, we come to 33 AD. 33 AD. Whoa, that's pretty amazing. It gets way better. It gets way better. Because when we go back to the book of Nehemiah, we see that the decree given to him was in the month Nisan. Do you know what month the Passover occurs in? Nisan. So we find that exactly the month which began all of this detail is the very month which Christ, our Passover lamb, was crucified. Although no day is given in the biblical text, 
for that decree on Nisan to Nehemiah, Dr. MacArthur notes that this was on the 10th of Nisan. And coincides to the day with Jesus' triumphal entry on the 10th of Nisan. Which, by the way, is the day from Exodus 14 that the Passover lamb was to be brought into the home. And you were to bring the Passover lamb into your home. And he was to be in your home until the 14th of Nisan where he would then be sacrificed in memory of the Passover where the blood was put upon the doorposts and the lintel. To the very day of the 10th of Nisan. And not only that, that this date, who was the, the coming of the Passover lamb, Jesus, who was the ultimate Passover lamb, who is called from John the Baptist in John 29 at his baptism, John says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And repeatedly we see that phrase, particularly in the book of Revelation, the Lamb. Remember, John is weeping because no one is found to open the scrolls. And to, and to expose the prophecy. And the angel says, look, the lamb who comes as if slain. Fabulous to recognize the fulfillment and the specificity of scripture. And more than that, the, proud, the, the crowds proclaiming Hosanna on Jesus' triumphal entry fulfill Psalm 118, 26 which was the formal proclamation of the coming of the son of David, who was Messiah, who now has been specifically called out as Jesus of Nazareth. And the final phrase of verse 25 indicate its building with plaza and moat is just what happened. How was that? A plaza is a large open city square. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem, as drawn in your Bibles as exists today, has a very large surface, a very large plaza for public gathering. Boom. The moat, what about that? That word moat is used one time in the Hebrew Bible. When we try to understand words in the scripture that are only used one time, we can't go to other places in the Bible to look at other usages because there aren't any. So then we go to the extra biblical sources. When we see a Greek word that is used in the Bible one time, then we start looking at Plato. We start looking at Philo. We start looking at Socrates. We start looking at all of these other sources to see how they use the word. This Hebrew word for moat doesn't exist in any of those sources. We see it in one Akkadian text, and we see it in one other place where the word is translated as wall. And scholars believe that this was the meaning of that word and that the translation mode has carried forward, but in effect what it meant was a perimeter around the city which often was a wall. And by the way, do you know what goes around the city of Jerusalem? It's a wall. Just exactly as the scripture tells us. A word of caution must be exercised regarding the dating that we've spoken about. There are, there are so many aspects to this. The exact date of Artaxerxes' decree to Nehemiah. The month is given, but the date, the year comes from extra biblical sources. So it's, it's fairly well tied down but at 444, but it's hard to be dogmatic. Also, what happened with the Jewish calendar? They had 360 days. They had to do something to adjust that calendar so that all of a sudden their months didn't get totally out of whack. And remember, their months were the focus of their harvests and of their feasts. So we don't understand each of those details. But all of this information is not nearly as specific or as powerful as what we see in verse 26. 
And Lord willing, we'll be back next week to carry on and see what's in verse 26 and 27. Because it is beautiful to recognize the specificity of the coming of Messiah and the week that follows and all of the details that come together in Scripture through these various points. Questions? Cries of shock, outrage? I'd love to go on, but we'll be here till 10 o'clock, so I could talk all night, but you probably figured that out already. Well, it will be wonderful. Continue to read, continue to look and think about these things. Spend some specific time looking at these verses this week. Read them slowly. Read them carefully. Look at the cross-references because the stuff we see next week is going to blow your mind even more than this fantastic fulfillment of prophecy. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement it is to our hearts. Thank you how it helps us in our faith. Thank you, Father, how incredibly dynamic and how phenomenally specific is your word. Father, we thank you for that. We, we could not ask, nor do we deserve such specificity. But Father, what a joy it is that you have given it to us to encourage our hearts, to strengthen us. Lord, we, we should need only your promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us, that you are always with us and that you are working through every detail. But thank you that you know the frailty, you know the weakness of our hearts. You know, Lord, that it is in you and you alone that this perfect fulfillment comes to fruition. And you have given us insight and understanding just as you did Daniel. And we're overwhelmed to consider it. To recognize that it is quite likely that the things that you have shown to us confirm to the very day the coming of the Prince who is Messiah, who is our Messiah, who is our Christ the anointed one who has saved us from the wrath to come. We praise you for this, Lord. Be glorified in our lives. Strengthen us as a result of our time together and encourage our fellowship. Help us to be faithful in the proclamation of the name of Christ, the only name under heaven and on earth by which men can be saved. And for this, we will give you thanks. Praying it all in the most holy name which we will ever speak the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.